Hello and welcome to the Inside Intelligence event series brought to you by the Johns Hopkins University Master's in Intelligence Analysis Program and Advanced Academic Program. <laughs> Today's event features a panel discussion on the role of intelligence analysis in cybersecurity. My name is Peter Huggins and I'm the event producer. Please note today's program will be recorded and uploaded to the AAP YouTube channel under the Inside Intelligence playlist. During the program, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function and we will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A portion of the event. With that, I will turn over the event to our host of the program, Dr. Michael Ard. Thank you, Peter, and welcome everyone to Inside Intelligence. Today we have a roundtable discussion on the role intelligence analysis can play in cybersecurity. We're looking forward to a very lively discussion. Uh, everyone, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A and we'll get to all your questions. Now, first, let me introduce our distinguished panelists. Uh, Rhea Sears is an attorney and policy expert in the cybersecurity area, arena, served in the NSA senior representative to the FBI, as well as NSA's deputy associate director of policy. Ms. Sears is a member of the adjunct faculty of Johns Hopkins University, where she teaches courses on cyber threats, data privacy, and ethics and intelligence. She is co-author of the book, Cyber Warfare, Understanding the Law, Policy, and Technology. Dr. Hector Santiago joined the uh, Johns Hopkins Carey Business School in 2018 and teaches a cybersecurity course at the Washington DC campus. He works for the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation as a cybersecurity specialist, leaving his previous post at the Department of Homeland Security Center, uh, Cyber Mission Center as a lead for data analytic programs. He has served the United States in various capacities within the cybersecurity telecommunications sphere in and out of uniform for over 20 years. Now, thank you both for joining us, being with us here today. We're looking forward to this discussion. Rhea, let's get the ball rolling today. Uh, what you. do you think, what do you see as the role uh, traditional intelligence analysis can play in cybersecurity? So I'm often asked if cyber intelligence analysis is markedly different than standard intelligence analysis. Mm -hmm. And my answer is uh, yes and no. Yes, because it demands certain technical knowledge. No, because intelligence analysis tradecraft skills are also critical in cyber intelligence. So in my career, I watched how cyber intelligence developed from this reluctance to share um, technical detail, what we used to call the keys to the kingdom, to uh, cyber information evolving into intelligence in uh, tradecraft format and dissemination. And cyber is often focused on threat intelligence. In fact, that's what a lot of intelligence entities, especially in the private sector, call themselves, cyber threat intelligence. And that's sometimes quite tactical in nature. But ultimately, um, there has to be more than that. Uh, like other intelligence, cyber intelligence analysis has to add value to the information and, if possible, reduce uncertainty for the consumer. And cyber intelligence is not only about attribution, although there is a natural desire to get that whodunit information above all else, but that's not always possible. So when I think of cyber intelligence analysis, I think it has to help encountering something that I call uh, lovingly Chicken Little Cybersecurity. So you might recall a story of Chicken Little, he gets hit in the head by a couple of egg corns, decides the sky is falling. Well, a lot of folks, especially senior policymakers or a company board or C-suite are hit with a daily barrage of bad news about cyber attacks from their Twitter feed and elsewhere. By the way, this is the problem with data versus analysis. Not every cyber event applies to every company or entity. The only way to keep the sky from falling in on you is incisive analysis and context. And it's equally important for analysts uh, and their consumers to understand the differences between cyber threat, vulnerability, and risk and communicate this clearly um, in their analysis. And I know the terms threat and risk are used across many disciplines. In terms of cyber intelligence analysis, here's how I would basically put it. 
Threat is something discovered with the potential to harm systems or information. Uh, example of a threat would be information about a new piece of malware or a new criminal group. Um, it has not been determined yet whether these are necessarily applicable to a specific network or target. A vulnerability is a known or unknown weakness in a network or software, which if exploited could cause harm. Thus every week you hear of patches to fix known vulnerabilities from Microsoft, for example. Risk is the potential loss or damage if a vulnerability is exploited. Uh, the risk of financial, reputational harm, disruption of business, government, or other operations. So what does cyber intelligence analysts actually analyze? Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just about attribution. It includes things like the history of an attack, um, previous observation, motives or intentions of attackers, victims or targets pursuant to the vector they're in, in terms of the industry, location, vulnerabilities, other factors, impact, risks for the targeted network and related enterprises, and a breakdown of tactics like reconnaissance, phishing, social engineering, uh, type of malware, systems compromise, the list is probably endless. So the next question that I'm always asked is, what are the things cyber intelligence analysts should know? Um, now, it's not just should know, but should learn, I should say. So my short basic list, and there's a lot more to it, I, I'm sure, includes five items. The first is how malware or malicious software operates. Uh, the second is how cyber criminals and hackers construct and execute campaigns. The third is intelligence tradecraft skills. In other words, standard intelligence analysis tradecraft skills on how to uncover and interpret information about threat actors. The fourth, analytic and critical thinking skills to lead to observations and recommendations that are relevant and actionable. And the fifth is really not just technology and skills, but multidisciplinary skills with a really heavy helping of an ability to translate between tech and non-tech colleagues and customers. And so that's my basic cheat sheet about intelligence analysis and cyber intelligence analysis. So I'll stop here. Well, that, that's actually quite a list of things <laughs> that, you know, uh, for, uh, can we expect that from a new, you know, a, a new uh, cybersecurity analyst? How long does it take to get all those five skills? Uh, I would say that depends. Some of it, uh, I got some of it by osmosis just sitting where I was sitting, but I, I think you have to have a plan and you have to decide what your priorities are and what's most um, prevalent in your environment. And I bet Hector can provide us a lot of insight about how to go about getting it. That's my segue to you, Hector. <laughs> that was, well, I was gonna say, if, if Michael, if you were gonna ask me the same question, I was just saying what Rhea said. You covered a lot, Rhea, it's outstanding. Yes. And everything, I'm on board. I'm gonna ride your coattails here. Um, if I may address the two things that Rhea said, I need to drill down there because I think these are distinctions that need to be made for, for, for burgeoning students or, or people that are interested in, within the field. Okay, what is the major distinction? You're going to find it uh, very rare that an intelligence analyst has to potentially write three different products for the same uh, event. And what do I mean by that? Uh, you have leadership, you have management, and then you have the technical, the, the, the techies, the technicians. Uh, you can rest assured that any time intelligence anal uh, intel an intelligence analyst is being asked to do something for cybersecurity, it's being uh, it, that product, that deliverable is catering to typically one of those at to the detriment of the other two. OK, so a lot of times leadership, they're not tech savvy and they they simply need to know how this is going to affect their ship of state and whether this is going to compel them to zig or to zag. OK, the management. They want to know how to measure success or failure based on whatever it is their leadership tells them to do. The technicians, they couldn't care less about who's hitting them. They want to know what's hitting them and potentially how they can do, how they can punch keys in order to get the job done for network defense. So very, very different from Geopole from what I've experienced. Mm -hmm. Rhea or other people might have a different, but typically I, uh, all of my mentors were cold warriors. All they had to say was the Russians did it. Guess what? You're getting promoted, Bob. 
That was basically <laughs> it. Very, very different in cyber, where once again, you typically have three different elements within one organization that need to be catered to. Okay. The other thing with regard to uh, data and, and information. Okay. The major, another major distinction, and Rhea, Rhea just hit the nail on the head. The, the most overused, and I've written on this extensively, the most overused word in intelligence is indicator. Okay. Indicator mm -hmm. means something specific. It means when you see this, there has been some type of study, some type of diagnostic done to ensure that when you see this, it also likely almost certainly means this. And yet in cyber, the, the chicken little aspect that Rhea alluded to, okay. The second something pops up on the screen, the term indicator gets thrown around so that people get worried. Uh, with regard to returns on investment for assets or, or, or allocations made to defense are not as well justified as they should be. And then the CFOs and the CEOs and the CIOs have, and the CISOs, excuse me, have to get together and figure out why the millions they spent on whatever it is that they, that they were compelled to do didn't work. And now they have to go back to the drawing board and figure out what it is that's going to allow them to, uh, I should say, raise their ROI, which they weren't doing before. Again, mm -hmm. the, the key takeaway there, indicator means something specific that everyone knows through study or a finding. It, it, there's a high correlation and potentially a high causation, okay? Mm -hmm. And yet that thing, you're going to hear that word left, right, and center people from people that don't know what they're talking about. Forgive me. Let's, let's talk a little bit about, and it's a very compelling phrase, you know, uh, this sort of chicken little um, element to uh, cyber security here um, because uh, there's a, I have to admit I there's often a very breathless tone to a lot of the articles in the popular press about cyber attacks and it's very difficult I think for the layman to understand exactly okay well how do I put this in perspective you know is this uh, you know uh, and frankly if a lot of people who probably should know better would use very um, a lot of uh, histrionics when referring to cyber attacks. So, uh, what do you what do you both think about that? I mean, you know, I'm you know what I mean by histrionics. You know, uh, cyber Pearl Harbors and things like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> we had the same reaction to cyber <laughs> Pearl Harbor. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, we don't have to name the person who came up with that either. Well, <laughs> I, I want to say at the time it. You know, we're talking over a decade ago. It, it was a way of getting attention to a problem that uh, I don't think a lot of the policy or business community was keyed into. So I'll, I'll give them that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know how many times I've heard people say cyber attack when it was an attempted intrusion into a system. Um, and um, just kind of a lack of clarity. Uh, in terms of the words they use. And one of the things I try to do is establish a cyber lexicon with people. So we know, because just like every lexicon, like in counterterrorism and other things, there are different definitions for everything. And, and you have to establish that. And I would say that could be pretty difficult if you're not seeing people on a regular basis. But I mean, that's one of the things I look for that I'm really careful in terms of the exact words that are used um, to explain something. And so I just saw an example yesterday, frankly, um, a great article in the Washington Post about the current situation being between uh, Russia and Ukraine and specifically cyber. Uh, it was not, it was called cyber attacks, but it was about the fact that the Russians have clearly run an intelligence operation and have inserted malware in all kinds of Ukrainian institutions and they've mapped them out, which is very, typical um, and certainly not unusual for the Russians. And it was depicted as a cyber attack. Well, it, it could be down the road, it could cause one down the road, but it isn't one right now. And this jumping to conclusions and saying, this yes. means we're under attack um, is, I well, in this case, obviously pretty dangerous, but even on a smaller scale, um, can cause an overreaction or a diversion from something that needs to be taken care of. So if I may, Michael, address as well. 
Rhea, once again, I've got to ride your coattails. I, I grew up all of my, as we were speaking before, uh, most of my mentors were called warriors. So when, when cyber and the internet, you know, like uh, mid to late nineties came out, uh, you know, if you hit, if you picked up a monitor and hit them on uh, uh, someone else on the head, that was a cyber attack, right? That was, <laughs> we're talking about a very broad definition here, but um, to your point with regard to lexicon, let me tell you that per, a, a part, a, an aspect of intelligence analysis that everyone's going to have to deal with, especially whether it's commercial or in the government or, or military for that matter, uh, is the lexicon, which is typically based on whether an entity or an agency is going to benefit from it or not, right? Uh, the reason There's something called the Cyber Threat Framework, which was developed by the Office of Director of National Intelligence back in the day, uh, or at least it was promoted by it, pushed out. The reason they felt the need, the ODNI felt the need to create this lexicon was because you had a number of key leadership engagements occurring around the table. We're talking about the tippy top back when DOD, uh, U.S. Department of Defense, decided that cyber was going to be taken from just an arena within air, land, sea, and space and become its own domain. Hence the creation and the thinking behind Cybercom being its own uh, combatant command. Okay, well, the people around the table because they were speaking different languages, they wanted to define things in a way that allowed them either greater budgets or more control, right? Mm -hmm. Surprise, surprise. So once again, with regard to how very important the lexicon is, you can typically tell how someone is going to benefit or whether they're going to uh, lose control or, or, or budget or resources based on how hard they fight to have a certain word either added or subtracted. Just something for the future bureaucrats in our audience, okay? <laughs> With regard to standards, however, very, very important. Uh, it, it, you can't, the technical aspects of a skill set that Rio was alluding to, okay? Uh, you're not going to, this isn't, you don't just simply hold a book to your head and internalize them. It has to be a practice, okay? It has to be something you do uh, day after day after day to some extent so that it becomes part of your thinking part of your lexicon that said the most important thing you can do is separate the standards from the buzzwords what do i mean there are certain standards that mean a certain type of service or uh, expected service uh is undergirded or supported by technology that's offered however the problem there is that technology might be the one-stop shop or the or, or the the uh, that one solution that the vendor is offering in order to cater to customers that want that service. That does not mean that any dual use tech or pre-existing technology cannot be taken and rejiggered in order to provide the same service or level of service to customers or end users. Now, why do I say that? Because a lot of times people confuse the buzz with the standard. Okay. Try to separate the two. That is the most important. That will keep you simply from being a, a marketer of tech that vendors want to push to your leadership as compared to giving your leadership and the managers and the technicians that require your insight, your filters, the, the, the barest and the rawest assessment possible with regard to what the actual technology can do in order to support whatever it is malicious actors or maybe blue force. In other words, friends are trying to do. Very, very important to separate the two. I, um, general question. What do you consider the difference between uh, working as a cyber uh, intelligence analyst in the, uh, the public sector versus the private sector? Is there much of a difference? Are, uh, are there different expectations? How would you um, sort that out? Um, do you want to go? Oh, go ahead, Ria. I would just say um, in the private sector, there's often less resources to do it. Um, mm -hmm. There are less analysts, there are less trained analysts. Um, and so there's a bit of a, a learning curve that occurs in both directions. First, them learning about the nature of intelligence, uh, but people like me learning about the business. Um, and so I think that's that's a bit of a difference. And the other thing is your customer, your consumer might be looking for some different things. Um, and they are also looking for, although I think this is also true in the public sector, but on a broader basis, they're looking for a real, uh, they're, well, I think um, Hector already said ROI, they're looking for return on investment. Right. Um, they want to understand through metrics or other measures, how many attacks you stop, although I think that's a terrible metric, or they want to understand um, where their missing pieces are. 
mm-hmm. and why they cost so much money, by the way, but where <laughs> their missing pieces are and, and how you can how you can position them better defensively. And I've never been through an incident where at the end of it, um, the board or somebody says, oh, great job. No, the usual thing is, well, how can you make sure this never ever happens again? Which is uh, a very difficult standard to adhere to. Um, I'm not as used to that in the public sector where we assumed there was going to be a constant flow of uh, successful intrusions in some cases. Mm -hmm. Um, it's very different on the private side where it impacts the bottom line and you have to understand the risk to the bottom line. And that takes some learning too. If, if I may address that, Michael, as well, please. Yep. Okay. So Rhea alluded to something, which is absolutely, as far as I'm concerned, is the keystone to the whole cyber issue. Okay. Uh, acquisitions. Okay. The, The one, one major distinction now that, excuse me, that's my view. Okay. But one major distinction here between uh, commercial entities and, and perhaps governmental military types are budgets and timing. Why do I say that? Re alluded to the fact that because enterprises, organizations have what they consider very limited resources to allocate. In other words, if you're a for-profit entity, you have to make sure your stakeholders are happy, the owners of the company are happy. In the military or in the government, you're allotted this much money and you better spend it within the fiscal year or else you lose it. That is huge with regard to the mistakes being made from an acquisition standpoint. Why? There is no intelligence that supports acquisitions officers. That is a major, that is a major issue I've been attempting to highlight since my time early on as a WE analyst, okay? Now, why am I so, uh, I guess, like, uh, why, why so much zeal? Okay, everyone is attempting to build the cyber army that responds after we get hit. I got to tell you, it's much cheaper if you arm the acquisitions officers with all the intelligence that they need to know that the component they're about to deploy on your TCOM lines has already been compromised and they need to go shop for another vendor. It makes too much sense. Okay. Instead, what we do to these poor acquisitions and acquisitions is not sexy. I don't know. I don't know of any. I have plenty of friends who are logisticians. They're not sexy. They're great people. They're smart. The sexy, the, the sexy aspects of, of acquisitions are the, all the vendors attempting to compete for all the funds that they can get within that fiscal year, okay? We need to pay more attention to the people actually buying the components, actually going out to the vendors who are not providing these acquisitions officers with the right type of information that they need in order to make the decision for the government, for the people, for the nation. They're doing the best they can for the vendor. Okay, now what, with regard to once again timing and um, timing and acquisitions, the one uh, metric, or actually, there are two questions I would ask any vendor, and I was waiting to be able to provide this. Okay, there is no vendor that will ever tell you. So for those people that don't know, an S curve of innovation is basically a place where uh, any product, any service, uh, you can track typically track where introduction to a market, in other words, market penetration, potential maturity of the market, and then the downslope where maybe a a sense of normalcy occurs where now you get a a pretty good benchmark of how that product or service will do uh, within that market that you're looking at, okay? I have never, and supporting admirals, generals, cabinet level officials, EO, executive office of the president, there's no one, there is no one at any level of government that I know that has ever asked the vendor, hey, where on the S curve is this particular thing you're trying to sell me? <laughs> now, why is that important? Because with regard to ROI, you want to know whether you're buying a product that has already been hit so much, or excuse me, it is so prolific that it's now not a consideration by the malicious actors that are looking for someone to hit, right? I'm in a neighborhood, there are 100 homes, I buy a Rottweiler. I'm the only one in the neighborhood with a Rottweiler. Chances are, not not certain, but chances are my house will be uh, the, the criminals that wish to burglar anyone's house will 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 uh, will omit my home from consideration. At what point does everyone start to buy a Rottweiler where now it's a consideration that the vandals have to take, excuse me, the, the thieves have to take into consideration where that component now can be overtaken. Right. You never get that from a vendor. You never get the point where saturation has occurred, where now their tech or whatever it is they're trying to push on acquisitions officers or customers has already been overtaken. That is the most important question you can ask. That will save you a ton of money, okay, and a ton of heartache with regard to having to explain why your ROI shot through the floor after millions being spent. Well, I mean, you can't 
defend against every contingency. You can't, I mean, they're not going to spend uh, tons of money on this. They're going to, they're going to uh, defend against what are the common threats, right? Well, they, it's not just defend, it's also resiliency, which is a buzzword now, of course, being marketed heavily. But um, the question is preparation and knowing how the pieces work together. It, it's, and, and let's, and, and this is not that different from the government. I don't know what you think, Hector, but you know, even um, the, the budget um, for each agency is done years in advance, right? And so there's not always, although there are some places that excel at this, a tech strategy that is championing resilience, but also seeing far enough ahead in the future, which by the way, that strategic piece is ripe for intelligence analysis skills. That's exactly, I, I tell you what, Rhea, this, this is the Rhea show starring Hector. This, that, seriously, <laughs> um, with, with, with regard to, but here's the problem. Here, here's where, where Rhea and I might diverge slightly, if at all. Um, no matter what is planned, right? The fact that you now have a finish line as to spend all of your fun, no matter what's happening in the country, no matter what, no matter how many solar winds or caseas you have, right? Unless you get uh, the president to sign off from a governmental standpoint, to sign off on some type of, of tech sprint or something to bolster defenses or protection or resiliency, those, once again, those act, the people, not only acquisitions offices, but everyone responsible for networks, uh, network hygiene and such, the, um, security, they have a limited amount of time in which they have to spend that money or commit to that action before it gets taken away from them, regardless of what else might be happening. And because they don't have anyone that they can trust whispering in their ear saying, hey, I know this is, I, I, I know you're under the gun. I know you're anxious to spend this money. I know you're, you're anxious to satisfy the, uh, the, uh, the requirements of the, of the users of the technology that you want to purchase. They don't have anyone al allowing them any, um, I guess, foresight, insight and foresight. In other words, what's happening now and what, and how will your actions now with regards to signing off on this tech or this service affect things in the future when this is deployed all over your lines? And now you can't remove the component or you can't stop your operations because you're mission critical. So let me contrast that also with, and I don't disagree with Hector, on the public side as well. There have been a number of um, efforts within the intelligence community to to look at a number of, of important trends. They, before it was artificial intelligence and quantum computing, among other things. So trying to, to see what the future holds in terms of technology and apply it, it's a little harder to do in the private sector. Um, there's not a lot of discretionary income for that. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, but, but that doesn't mean you can't partner, by the way, with academia on those subjects, which is, which is really important. And some companies do it very well and some don't do it at all. Same goes for government agencies. So, Actually, Rhea, Rhea, Michael, Rhea brings up a point. Can I address something? Please go ahead. Okay. So for those that don't know, an ISAC is an information sharing analytical center. Okay. What an ISAC is supposed to do. So, okay. Rhea is an entity. Rhea is a, co a corporate entity. Michael's a corporate entity. They're both in the same sector. What I, as the government, should not be doing is providing intelligence to RIA, allowing her a competitive advantage in some way that Michael does not have. What mm -hmm. the ISACs do, they're the bridge between uh, a sector, businesses, commercial, and the government, so that whatever goes to the ISAC should go to everyone within that sector. That's what should happen. However, once again, with regard to dissemination of intelligence, because a number of these ISACs are subscription-based, okay, you have a number of... From an internet working standpoint, forgive me, a little bit of context, you can build up your defenses all you like. The second you decide to peer with someone else who hasn't built up their defenses, guess what? That's your weak link in the chain. Okay. If you're not providing that person, that guy, that gal with an intel that the big blue chips have, the chances of you potentially being owned through them as a vector to your networks goes up through the roof. Okay. And yet right from the get-go with regard to information sharing, that allows everyone to know what they should be doing or maybe a standard that they need to hit, they're already, um, th there's already a, a mismatch there, okay? Mm -hmm. I just needed to highlight that with regard to um, what, what entities exist 
and wh what the reality is with regard to what should be done and what actually is done. So the, there's there's a change here too that's I hope is coming. I, I want to be try to be a little optimistic. Um, the private sector complains constantly, even if they are involved in the ISACs, that they're throwing in their intelligence, in other words, stuff they're gathering on threats and vulnerabilities over the transom and the government doesn't tell them what they do with it. Um, this has been an ongoing, I've been on both sides of that whining session. So, um, you know, this is an ongoing problem. And I, I do see right now some efforts to try to try to do better in terms of collaboration. We always talk about information sharing, but it's more of a collaboration issue. Um, and if you look now, you'll see, and I, I hope there'll be jobs from this as well, some centers that open that share better. But I'll add this one thing, and this is for students. One of the problems with this is the government can throw over all the intel they want, but sometimes it's written in another language and it's English, but it's another language because it's intel jargon. You have to be familiar with the way intelligence is written to be able to use it. And um, you get that from experience and you get that, you know, you get the basics in a classroom, um, but that there's going to be demand for that as well, being able to understand and translate once again, what the government is trying to say to you. Absolutely. That suggests that we have a pretty good opportunity here for people with intelligence backgrounds to uh, segue their career into cybersecurity, maybe after they finish their tour of duty or or what have you, or, or mid-career change, right? I mean, there, there seems to be some uh, opportunities there and they'd have the skill set to perhaps learn cybersecurity. Uh, so, Rhea, if I may? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. Um, and actually, this is one of the other things we were discussing. So I teach an intro to cybersecurity class for Johns Hopkins as well. One of the things I have students literally who are anywhere from 18 to maybe in their mid fifties, typically um, one of the issue, excuse me, it's not an issue, but one of the challenges that people face is, you know what, they caught the bug. They want to learn more about cybersecurity, perhaps even um, go into it as um, either augment their, their pre-existing skills or maybe a, a career change entirely. The thing is, you have to decide at what, how much you're willing to sacrifice at that point. The one thing to provide a little context that everyone needs to understand, and it's funny we spoke about this before, cybersecurity is a team sport. Any person that tells you that they know everything and that you should listen to them, they're out of their minds, walk away quickly, okay, before right. you become infected with whatever they have, okay? What you need to decide is you need to decide which aspects of cybersecurity or telecommunications, because I, I tend to bleed a lot of, one bleeds into the... It, I tend to combine the two, okay? Um, what aspects are most exciting to you and then try to become the expert in it. Read what's easy to read for you at that level immediately and continue to try and learn. The second, where I've seen failures occur with regard to someone that tries to do a bunch of stuff and really is spinning their wheels, uh, there is no focus in an area, at which point, yes, you can speak to certain issues, but it's very, very hard to market yourself uh, and, and basically find that one job that will allow you to get your foot in the door and then potentially learn more. People want to be able to trust you with a function and know that if something happens, that we have some, we, we've got that guy or that gal in-house that can do that thing. That's what people want. You take it upon yourself to learn every other thing that you deem necessary in order to uh, take yourself to a higher level. I, and I agree. And I also think you, you have to find a little bit of a niche um, and you have to bear in mind where you are in your career in terms of that. So I've seen, obviously, from my own background, a lot of people enter cybersecurity through policy and the law. Um, not always the best way to enter, but it's certainly one way to enter. And that's how you educate yourself. Um, that's how you make sure you attend every simulation you can, every um, demo, every demo of new technology that you can. So it starts to percolate in everything you do. Um, so you have to find that niche and then you really do have to create um, a line of study in terms of what you need. Um, there's a big argument ongoing, and I don't know how Hector feels about it, about which certifications and other things people need. Sometimes those are obstacles. Sometimes those help get you in the gate. 
Um, but certainly that should be part of it. And I was just advising a rather young person who's probably going to be uh, a cyber genius at some time about what he should do. And I was, I, I was actually so impressed that he wanted to learn about every single area, not just hacking, you know? <laughs> and he wanted yeah. to understand the background. He wanted to understand the ethics. Um, you make yourself more marketable when you show you have a niche, but you also have the ability to be multidisciplinary. And by the way, communication skills. Oh my goodness. Absolutely. Um, they're necessary in intelligence analysis. They're ne very necessary in cyber intelligence analysis. I talked about translating. Um, a lot of times I check myself when I um, speak to a class because I use terms and I say, I have to be able to find every term on the run as I'm talking to them. And sometimes I don't remember everything 100%. So it's really important that you, you're able to, to use language that you really do understand and explain to people who might not um, and do it, with, um, do it with enthusiasm, I put it that way. Let me uh, get to Michael. some of the questions, oh, folks. Let me yeah. get to some of the questions that are in the chat. And uh, thanks for, uh, this has been a really interesting uh, conversation on these topics. And uh, I have a feeling um, we can be going for a long time. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that uh, I'd like to get to a few questions. Uh, Gabrielle, I th thank you for that question. I think uh, your question about skills for intelligence analysts was answered, but ask it again uh, in a different way if we missed that. Um, I have a couple of questions, uh, one from Claire uh, and Eva about the level of technical competency uh, you think would be needed for, for an analyst going into cybersecurity. So what would be, uh, can we define that in a way where, or uh, specify what type of technical competency would one need uh, to start a career in cybersecurity? Can I, if I can address that very quickly, Please. or at least my view, it depends. Right now, you're going to hear that a lot in the intelligence community. But the thing is, you don't know who you're if you're working at higher levels. Let's say you are a two element within the military, depending on whether you're the G2 working under generals or a J2 in a platoon someplace forward deployed. The type of tech that you're using and that you have to analyze and help us give us an assessment on is going to be very different if you're working for one of the blue chips. Um, Walmart, Amazon, Google on something high level and they're attempting to defend against corporate, corporate espionage, for example. In other words, you, the, you're, you had better have a game plan as Rhea alluded to, because if not, you're gonna get thrown to the four winds. You might not end up in the position you want, looking at the tech you want, providing the support you want, okay? Now, it's not going to always happen, obviously, even if you do have a plan, but it will allow you to get to places you want to be and then decide at that point, uh, what level of um, technical, excuse me, what level of support you want to give and then potentially what you need to internalize once you're there in that organization. It's very, very rare I've found and I've heard that uh, a technical, a technically savvy analyst has all the skills that are necessary when they go into a job. Typically, the good managers, the better managers are going to see that a person has promised that they enjoy doing what they're doing with regard to technical aspects and that they can bring a person in, hand them a textbook, say, memorize this in a month and it'll get done. Now, that's that that's, again, right. both from experience and anecdotally. Right. Very good. Uh, Patrick, would you mind rephrasing that? Uh, what do you mean by automate this process? If you could rephrase that question, I'll get to it. Thank you. Um, another question, this is, an, this is a more of a big thing question uh, for both of you. Who as an organization gets cybersecurity right and why? So uh, it depends how you define right. Um, mm -hmm. I don't consider uh, a 1000 batting average against all threats to be right. I, I think you're down to about 500. So being able to um, block risk, some risk, um, I, especially the most potentially critical would be one of the measures I would use. And I would say, in all honesty, that the financial sector, um, and I'm not just saying there because I spent a, that because I spent a little time there has been somewhat successful, especially obviously the larger banks, but they started early. They started out of the gate. 
um, after they got attacked by the Iranians in 2013, I believe. And so they've developed all these things, these information sharing groups, they've developed threat intelligence. They are applying things like um, the MITRE attack um, paradigm to their actual defenses. They have a lot of money, I'll add, right? And so right. they're applying it. So that's one area. And I do think there are some federal agencies, not all federal agencies that have become fairly pr proficient. And then finally, defense contractors, I would mention, because they're involved in something called the DIB, the Defense Intelligence Board, that um, provides them with really good intelligence because they're sitting on national security issues. So I would use those three as an example. Um, there are other companies as well that have excelled, but again, your, your standard cannot be, your, nobody's ever successful. The question is how deep is the intrusion? How big of a problem is it? Um, and by the way, you can be great at what you do and have a third party uh, linkage bring you down, which has to be the most yeah. depressing thing on the planet. Um, so we've seen um, examples of that, a lot of examples of that recently. So I can't, I can't, uh, I'm not ready to give a particular entity, but I can give you two practices that I believe you should look for in order to see who the best are. First are with regards to cyber hygiene. If you look at any of the major hits that have occurred outside of Stuxnet or anything that was particular to, a, to, to one specific facility, okay, most of the major hits that occurred were occurred because whatever whatever uh, tech, whatever communications components were being used um, on top, if you will. Okay, with regard to backwards integration or legacy tech, the lack of cyber hygiene that was done allowed people to use older hacks that had either been forgotten about or weren't even known because all the people that used to work on those uh, on that tech were now gone, retired. Okay, so. Anyone not performing certain levels, at least requisite levels of cyber hygiene, staying on top of themselves, are sure to get hacked. And the, the, the I don't want to say criminal, the tragedy there is the ROI shoots down. Why? You've spent all this money on top. Everything was bang, blinking like a, a dashboard on, on the USS Enterprise. But guess what? Everything, all the foundation that you're built upon has so many gaps and holes in it that you don't know about. It's only a matter of time before you get hacked. Uh, the other thing is uh, with regard to mergers and acquisitions, once again, uh, a network uh, to, to get a bit philosophical here is the only thing, one of the only things that actually is greater in, uh, in value, the more it grows. If you think about it, everything else has to be rare. That has to be one of them, two of them. No, I don't want a network with two people. I want a network with as many as possible. That's value. Okay. The problem is I don't know anyone or I don't know very many that perform uh, risk assessments each and every time they merge or acquire another entity. In other words, everyone has a risk assessment that they perform for their enterprise. And then they hope that whatever, wh wh whomever they're merging or, or are acquiring has at least a similar level, or they take the person's, uh, excuse me, they take the CISOs or the CIOs word for it, at which point there isn't as much of an overall assessment for the new entity done. Okay, I've seen that happen a few times. Um, again, the, it, is it expensive? Yes. Is it costly? Yes. But Rio alluded to reputational damage, I believe, before. Okay, think about that. The second you don't buy that component or don't uh, take on that protocol, not 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 a not IT level, but literally like human beings, uh, internal protocols, internal security protocols. What you're now doing is opening yourself up for massive losses from a customer base and not from a reputational standpoint, which is going to cost you even more money later on. Another question in the chat. Barbara asks, what's, uh, would the study of counterintelligence be helpful for people interested in a cybersecurity career? Well, it can't hurt. Um, and of course, there's a huge <laughs> issue of insider threat in right. uh, cyber. In fact, there's a whole bunch of recent articles about how um, criminal groups and certain state actors are seeking to recruit people inside an enterprise to implant uh, ransomware. So insider threat in particular, I think is really important. I also think in terms of counterintelligence, the use of social media and other things um, and disinformation 
can be part of what people are looking at in cyber. So my feeling is, I happen to feel pretty strongly that the more you can learn about intelligence, even if it's not purely cyber or purely technical, helps you in your critical thinking and your analysis. And you know, when I think back about the skills I first got when I entered NSA, which were not technical because I was like a Middle East analyst, um, and how that developed, it, it all develops from this similar foundation. Um, that's what, frankly, makes good intelligence analysts, good cyber intelligence analysts, you know, once they feel comfortable with the tech part. Good. I have another question from the chat. Uh, do you think cyber threat intelligence can be automated? Tools such as OpenCTI do a good job at visualizing CTI for trained analysts but I haven't come across any tools that actually give a valuable output to act on. Is there anything you have come across that might? Actually, I, if I could address that. Sure. I haven't come across anything yet. There are a number. So there's a term that you need to learn immediately. Okay. From an, uh, from an anal an intelligent analyst standpoint, as well as cybersecurity defense in depth, right? The second you're depending on one thing to safeguard the keep, your, your host, your owned, your toast, okay? Uh, you have to develop many different things that work together, okay? That work together, that work randomly so that you can't time certain things that don't depend on each other so that your fault tolerance is much higher if one of those things goes down, so on and so forth. With regard to uh, automation, I don't know. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, we're going to get a little bit technical, but this is something you need to know. There's something called CDM, which is continuous diagnostic and mitigation. So what that basically means is, your network, you take a baseline of what you consider normal activity to be over a specific amount of time, let's say Monday through Friday, right? You don't expect anyone, if, you were, if, you, if you're pushing a nine to five uh, enterprise, you don't expect any type of large data spikes to be occurring at midnight, so on and so forth. The issue with that is that's programmed by human beings who might not know every single conceivable trick uh, that can occur within certain amounts of time. Uh, let me let me give you an example. Um, actually, it's an example I give in my course. Okay, uh, there is a I give two um, two tr two uh, two line graphs. Excuse me. One that has uh, one that has activity, malicious activity occurring Monday through Friday, and then one that has it occurring on the weekends. And what I tell my students is based on the culture of the organization, based on uh, how that organization works. Okay, forgive me, I'm getting something here on my screen. Forgive me, I just had something pop up on my screen. No um, depending on how the organization works, how it aligns with whatever it needs to get done, that will determine the type of hack that I will perform against that organization. In other words, if I don't want anyone around, let's say I want a crypto mine, I'm gonna start Friday night when everybody's gone. I've got 48 hours to potentially overtake your, your, basically create bots out of every unit in your organization, program them to just, you know, basically mine as much as possible, and then get the heck out of Dodge uh, before Monday, before everyone steps in. Very different hack than if I need someone to click on a malicious executable that now allows me to own everything, potentially lock everything down, ask for ransomware. Automation doesn't do very well by itself, picking up on those distinctions, depending on the type of hack that someone wants to perform. Hopefully that makes sense to the person who asked the question. Okay, we have a few more. Um, what level of technical competency would you suggest for someone interested in being involved in cyber policy and diplomacy within the government or simply as an analyst with the government, not a private sector agency? So I really think, you at a very basic level, you need to be able to track what an intrusion or attack looks like. So I mentioned MITRE attack before. There's also the kill chain. Uh, it's not one of my favorite words, but, mm -hmm. um, and I think you need to be able to understand it from the beginning pieces to the end. And just having that overarching understanding to me is the, is the first step. Um, and in terms of cyber policy and diplomacy, um, you will have to read a very thick three volume vo uh, book called the Talon Manual, which discusses every potential problem of cyber legal and policy issues in the universe. 
in great detail. It's it's really good if you're having insomnia, but it's a brilliant piece of work. This is the Talon uh, Manual. The, the Talon, Talon Manual, named okay. after Talon in Estonia, and that's not an accident. Right, Talon Manual. And, um, and sponsored by NATO uh, eventually. It's a really great piece of work. I used a video from the guy who's in charge of the pro project, um, Mike Schmidt, um, in my class, just so they understand the context. And, and I think you have to understand the types of issues that are being broached under international humanitarian law, because there is no international cyber law per se, so that you're prepared um, to deal with those kind of issues. But remember, it's also the knowledge of how things run. I, I will tell you that I, when I did, when I was doing some legal work for a cyber practice, um, I once dealt with another firm who was a great lawyer and understood privacy, soup to nuts, but didn't know what a firewall was and didn't really know what malware was. So you have to be conversant with those things. You don't have to be an expert on every single thing. Once again, I, I mean, I don't think any of us are, um, it, but you need to understand, I would call it the 25,000 foot view of how cyber works. And it's not just cyber, I should add the internet um, and Hector mentioned telecom. I mean, there are a lot of different elements to it. And that to me is almost an introductory understanding. It's not, um, it's not taking a hundred different courses, right? I, you know, I just make an observation. I, in my role as a program director, I see a lot of um, CVs from people. I see a lot of applications. And it's interesting to me that um, many students who have had undergraduate backgrounds in uh, some cybersecurity have gone and meet, have gone right into that uh, profession right out of uh, right out of college and have had and have uh, had interesting careers for themselves and I'm seeing them well, right now there's a reason for that school. pardon One, there's a big reason there's a huge skills gap in cyber absolutely and i have seen people hired as cyber analysts who've never been near a cyber um, in their right. lives. Right. And, and I have to say, I'm sure if I wasn't an NSA person, people would say the same thing about me. Um, but I've seen a cyber operation. They, you know, as soon as somebody sees cyber in your CV, they get excited because it's really hard to find people. Now, of course, they're probably not looking at you for a technical job per se, but you'd be surprised. But they're certainly looking at you um, for an analyst because I, I don't I don't even remember Hector what the gap is at this point, and it may be just a stupid number, but it's you know it's tens of thousands of jobs that aren't filled. Um, so, and uh, if you have that and a security clearance, holy cow! Yeah, it's right. game on. Actually, it's a. a um, Rhea, depending on what you're looking at, I, it's something like, I had this stat a few years ago, it was something like 400,000 jobs in the US alone and something like a few million around the world, right? So the people watching this should not be just considering US government, blah, blah, blah. No, there, there's a skills gap all over the planet, okay? Um, people are looking for good people that they can trust uh, to, to Rhea's point regarding a clearance. If you have a clearance, you're fantastic. If you don't, fine, drive on, but there are people that will still look at your CV, look at your resume and, and say, okay, is this person good enough for them to bring, for us to bring them in and then teach them whatever else we need them to know? Right. Because so much of it's on the job, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's very, I mean, after when the push comes to shove, you're really learning probably how would, you, what would percentage would you put on it? It's what percent? In the classroom and on the job. Holy mackerel. Um, <laughs> okay, this is um, I'm just this is Hector Santiago speaking. I'd say ninety percent of it comes on the job. I, that would be because not, that ten percent. Yeah, you hold you do the amazing Kreski. You hold yeah. the textbook to your head. Okay, <laughs> now you take a date. You, you take a brain dump, depending on whether you're going to brief or take a test, whatever, what have you. When you're in, when you're in, when it's OJT on the job training. To Ria's point that she made earlier, you start now to see what the. Uh, what precipitated an attack, the course it took, and then the impacts. You get to learn right. all of that under one umbrella, which is you, uh, you can't get that anywhere else. And so I'll clear, give you my example though. I, um, and I actually worked with a course like this for a company. You know, you study malware, right? You, there's some incredible textbooks and stuff, and then you're in it. 
and it's a completely different ball game. Um, yes. and, and that's fine. I, uh, people have to understand that that's expected. By the way, that's the same thing in the intelligence world. We don't, we may hire you because of your geopolitical or your language or your other background, but we don't expect you to walk in as a hundred percent expert. And if you believe you are, you're not going to have a good time of it, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> so, you know, I, people can prepare and they obviously are, and they're getting a lot of good stuff under their belt, but realize that you're going to learn on the job and it's perfectly normal and it's great. You know, and by the way, Claire, your question about communications gap, I mean, I really think this is the role of education, not 10%, you know, so where, where you can be able to speak to different levels of an organization has a lot to do with the type of uh, education you got before you came in. And that's always something to be thinking about. Yes, go ahead. Forgive me, I, I need to say one thing very quickly about communication intelligence formats. It's very, very important. You understand not all Intel is written the same way because different customers are going to need different things at different times. You're going to have to, one of the, to, to what Rio was saying, you're going to have to try to master all types because you never know what type of, of um, requirement is going to be foisted against you as an R, RFI request for information. Very important. The way you're taught nowadays is, hey, make an argument and then at the very end, give your conclusion. Exact opposite in Intel. The, the decision makers do not have time to read absolutely everything you're going to write, even if it's one page. They want to know right at tippy top what they should be considering. Just something to keep in mind. There's a, uh, another question in the chat, which I think uh, this is an interesting question from Isabella. Is cyber deterrence possible considering the complexities of the cyber threats, vulnerabilities and risk? I didn't get the first part, I'm sorry. Is cyber deterrence even possible considering what we're looking at in terms of threats, vulnerabilities? And risks? Yes, I believe it is. But there's two different levels of this. One is in the practice level in terms of defending industry or critical infrastructure. And the other one is at a higher state level in terms of policy and so-called red line. So let me take it to the first level. Um, you're not going to, deterrence doesn't mean 100% absolute, nothing gets in. And I, I think we have to understand that. But good deterrence relies on good cyber defense. And some of the stuff Hector was talking about, the simplest stuff that people don't execute on, like cyber hygiene, 90% um, of the way people get in, at least 90% get into networks is because of problems like that. So some of the deterrence comes from hardening your target, right? The other piece of a higher level of cyber deterrence, like as compared to nuclear deterrence, but frankly, I hate when people compl uh, compare nukes and cyber. So um, I, I, I think that that comes down to clearly stated policies and consequences like any red line you're gonna draw. If you draw a red line and they cross it and it doesn't matter, then it doesn't matter. We've had a history of having a problem using a deterrent against the Russians and the Chinese. There are a lot of reasons that's true. They're not all negative. It has to do with economics and other things. But right now, I mean, read what we're seeing about the administration, basically you know, telling the Russians, if you go farther in this area, um, we're gonna have an issue in cyber and then we'll see, and then we're gonna see what happens. Um, and I hope it doesn't come to that, but I certainly think there's some elements of there, of that there as well. And another part of deterrence that I don't think we always think about is this idea of signaling. Um, it's not just the red line, it's how you signal people as they walk up to it. And we haven't always been proficient at that because it's difficult and because policy can be inconsistent and there are disagreements within the government about what to do. So it is absolutely possible um, I think we're seeing some seeds of it in, in the current situation. I hope it succeeds. Michael, if, if I may, I think you waited till the very end. I might have to diverge here from Rhea and, and uh, with regard to um, whether deterrence is possible. I'm having difficulty or, or just based on what I've seen, uh, I have difficulty seeing that deterrence is possible based on the ease with which now it is easy to hack anyone that was unhackable before. So what do I mean by that? You currently have a situation based on COVID protocols that are keeping people either underemployed or unemployed. 
they're semi tech savvy. A number of people don't realize that the, the iPhone or whatever web enabled dev device they have in their hand is actually much more sophisticated than space shuttles that flew back in the day. You now combine that with uh, ransomware as a service vendors who are more than happy to sell access to tools and everything you need in order to remain anonymous, okay? And you have a perfect uh, formula or recipe for people who wouldn't normally take on those roles to become malicious actors in order to feed their families, pay bills, whatever it is, all over the planet, okay? Very, very difficult to deter that level of, of need, I should say, uh, especially, well, let's just, it's very difficult to deter anyone either at a nation state or at an individual level, especially since the nation states just simply continue to deny or remain far enough from those elements that they consider they might be working within the country domestically, but they have no official ties to the security uh, apparatuses within that country. So again, maybe a, a slight divergence there, but, but that's my view. Well, haven't there been some success stories lately? I mean, there's been some criminal groups that seem appear to be have been uh, rolled up even by, even in Russia. It, am I wrong? Uh, I think we have the same answer on this. You go. Okay. <laughs> or is that just smoke, smoke and mirrors? Go ahead, Rhea. Lay it on them. I mean, you know, um, they they kicked down a bunch of doors. They uh, arrested a bunch of guys, probably fairly low level, not mm. the people who are paying interest to Putin and uh, and his inner circle on this, um, and. We still have a huge ransomware problem. It hasn't gone away. Um, I just was looking at some stats the last few days, and you know it's going to grow, as Hector said, um, because it's so lucrative. And um, and by the way, just because you indict people doesn't mean you're going to stop them. As much as I love these indictments because they have so much declassified information in them, that's great mm -hmm. to teach from. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen? They indicted these um, people, Liberation Army folks. So what mm -hmm. happens? A friend of mine always likes to say, OK, you know, they indicted them. So now they can't ever go to Disneyland. I mean, what's the impact? Uh, right. um, yeah. And it, there is a name and shame thing. And that's an issue that we tried in counterterrorism, too. And I'm not sure it works here. Um, mm -hmm. And again, I think Hector alluded to this. The payoff is amazing. And these ransomware is a service, if you're not familiar with it, the fact that they license the, the malware, they even will give you negotiators to negotiate with your hostages. It's a whole cottage industry and we shut it down piece by piece sometimes, but you know, not in totality. So you have to look at perhaps policy that deals with things like cryptocurrency and other things, but that's a topic for another time. Final word everything, on that, Hector? Everything Rhea said. Um, <laughs> I, I cannot. So uh, what Rhea said, but uh, to your point with regard to the Russians in particular, there's absolutely no way, uh, as far as I'm concerned, once again, Hector Santiago is speaking on what he knows. Uh, some poor recruits within that organization were the ones that ended up on those photos of the FSB, Russian uh, FBI, if you will, uh, kicking down doors, taking the money. Uh, of course, if you look at any ransomware actor, dark side, Revil, anyone, okay, uh, all they do, uh, all they do is basically close up shop and then open it up a little bit later on somewhere else using the same tool, uh, or at least within the family of tools, okay. Yes. So, and Putin, there is no absolutely no way you can convince me that that is not something that Putin knows is a tool he can leverage to dance around the red lines that Rhea was talking about. It's not hitting It's not hitting the specific. It's not surpassing or exceeding past certain red lines that would elevate things. It's just annoying, but it's also highly lucrative and it's damaging to the organizations that are victimized. Perfect weapon. Very good. Uh, this has been great. I want to thank our guests, uh, Rhea Sears, Hector Santiago. Brilliant discussion. Lots of information put out today. I hope our listeners really enjoyed it. Um, thanks again, folks. And thanks for all the great questions from uh, the audience. Uh, please uh, take a look for the next installment of Inside Intelligence. I'm Michael Ard. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you for Thank having you. us. If anyone needs to reach Thank out, you. please feel free to use my email. Have a good day. Thank you.